If you would, uh, turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm chapter 19. I'm sure a favorite psalm of many of you. We have completed 1 Thessalonians. I am gearing up for the Gospel of John. And in the meantime, we are going to spend some time in the Psalms. I love the Psalms. Maybe you do as well. The Psalms are really wonderful because they're human expressions of how men are working out their theology. You might think of it like this. When you encounter the Psalms, you're not just encountering theology and doctrine, you're encountering men who are processing their doctrine and their theology and applying it. Well, Psalm 19 really is one of those Psalms that you may have memorized as a child. Many of you go back to it probably regularly because it does have contained in it, it is pregnant with some of, well, the most robust, deep, uh, challenging and encouraging doctrine that we encounter in the Psalms. I mean, you know it well. In verses one to six, we encounter God in his general revelation in creation. And then in verses seven to 10, we encounter God in his word. And there's arguably some of the most incredible statements we have in scripture about scripture. And then in 11 to 14, you see King David, who's writing this, respond to all this revelation that he's studying. Here's what I think is interesting about this psalm. Sometimes we come to this psalm, and I'll just say it like this, in an impersonal way. We come to this psalm to encounter the doctrine, which we should. It's wonderful. It's amazing. We come to consider creation as we ought, and God is creator. But we must remember that this psalm here is not just meant to be doctrinal, though it is highly doctrinal, but this psalm is to be very devotional. In fact, this psalm is a meditation. You remember last week in Psalm 1, I taught you meditation is not to empty your mind, it's to fill your mind with truth. Meditation is to look at truth from every angle, to consider it, to chew on it, to think of its implications, think of how it's convicting you, think how you can grow, think of what it's calling you to do to worship and live in light of it. Well, sometimes when we read Psalm 19, we neglect to see that Psalm 19 is actually King David, remember, the man after God's own very heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14, meditating. Psalm 19 is a biblical meditation. It is King David meditating on truth. How do we know that? Look at verse 14. David concludes these truths he's considering by saying this, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth, and see it, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. What is acceptable there? Be pleasing to you. David's whole point in Psalm 19 is to lay before his God in prayer what he hopes is a meditation that's accepted by God. And when we say accepted, we mean a meditation that God's pleased with. I mean, what believer doesn't want to spend time with God in his word and have confidence in the fact that God is pleased with them and how they're meditating? In fact, this entire psalm is about David helping the nation of Israel and us see how to meditate before God in ways he's pleased with. You see, this isn't just about David. Go back to the beginning of the psalm. This is David actually instructing the entire nation on how they are to meditate. How do we know that? Look at the inspired inscription. Just below your heading there in Psalm 19, your Bible probably says something like this. For the choir director, a psalm of David. That's inspired content. That means David wasn't just putting in scripture as inspired by God, his own prayer to God. He wanted this sent over to the choir director to give it a melody so that all the nation would sing it. That would be like me writing a song and saying, hey, Daniel, give it a tune, put a melody to this. And the purpose of that is, is when you put a melody to something and you add sound to the content and you add a, a rhythm to it and you add a tune to it, it makes it memorable. David wanted these meditations in Psalm 19 to stick to the minds of God's people. 
He wanted it memorable. He wanted them to be able to go back time and time again and meditate on these truths so that their life would be transformed by it and they too could offer meditations acceptable to God. And so really that's the way to come at this psalm. Rather than coming at this just by saying we're going to look at general revelation, creation. We're going to look at special revelation, which is the scripture. And then we're going to look at a response. The way to come at this psalm is to look at the entire thing as one long meditation. Where we are being instructed on how to meditate. And what type of meditation we should do is a thoughtful, careful, heart-probing meditation. You see, there's actually probably three meditations that show up. It's one long meditation, but we'll just say it has three moments of unique meditation. There's a meditation in verses 1 to 6 on creation. David meditates on God's creative power. There's a meditation in 7 to 10 on scripture. And then there's a meditation on David's own heart. He responds to creation and scripture. So if you're taking notes, that's exactly going to be our outline today. Three meditations, it's one long meditation, but we're breaking it up into three categories here. Three meditations that we can present to God that are pleasing to him. The entire purpose of this psalm is so that the nation of Israel knew how to meditate on the truth in a way that was pleasing to God. And so you and I as believers here today, we want to please the Lord. We want to honor him. We want him to be... um, We want to freshly express our heart's desire to please him. Well, here is biblical meditation from the man after God's own heart. So our outline will be again, three meditations that we can present to God that are pleasing to him. Three meditations we can present to God that are pleasing to him. I'm going to cover the entirety of the psalm when we go through it. So I'm just going to jump right in and we'll get through the entire thing today. But you can understand 14 verses is going to be a little bit of a challenge for me. So we're going to get through it together, though. I think you're going to be greatly encouraged. So let's just start into the psalm here for the sake of time, and we're going to go through every word and line by line of it. Three meditations that we can present to God that are pleasing to him. Meditation one, a meditation on creation. A meditation on creation. Notice verse one and two. The heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Now stop for a moment. Did you notice David in this meditation is using a poetic device? He's not talking, and God's not talking, but there's actually a new subject. Creation's talking. Did you see it there? Creation, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is being declared. But in the Hebrew, he's not just using language for speaking. He's actually using Hebrew verbs that go to preaching and declaration. So when you look at the beginning of Psalm 19, 1 to 6, you should be thinking this way. I'm about to receive a sermon, but the sermon's not from God. The sermon is not from David. The sermon is from creation. Now, of course, that's coming from God through his creation. But it's important to realize that what we are encountering is creation preaching to you. You are about to be preached at and to from creation. Notice, creation is telling, verse 1. Creation is declaring at the end of verse 1. Verse 2, creation is pouring forth speech. Verse 3, he goes on and on and on in creations, pouring forth the word. Now, The question we should ask then, if creation is preaching to us, what is the content of creation's sermon? If creation's going to preach to us, and we're going to meditate on that, what is the content of creation's sermon? Well, look at it, back at verse 1. The heavens, that is all that fills the sky and the universe, is telling or shouting And the first thing we see of creation's sermon is there's a single, singular message to creation's sermon. What is creation preaching to you? The glory of God. And not only that, notice their expanse, look back in the text, that's a word to describe all that encompasses heaven and all his creation. It is declaring or heralding, and it's preaching what? The work of God's hands. It's 
creation is presenting to us, beloved, that God as creator has fashioned his creation and he wants his creation to send a single sermon to us as the work of his hands. And the sermon is this. You exist to bring God glory. Simple sermon. The single sermon of creation is that you exist for the glory of God. Now let's talk about that for a second because that's what verse one says. Notice, the heavens are preaching the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It's a concept we use a lot. We sang about it today in the songs. It's a great concept. We should think about it for a second though because the word glory, the glory of God, comes from the Hebrew word kavod. And kavod actually means heaviness, weightiness. The, the, you could even translate this. Creation is preaching to us the heaviness of God, the weightiness of God, the godness of God. And it's obviously, creation's not talking about God's weight. It's talking about what ought to happen to a sinner, creation, when they encounter a creator. There ought to be a heaviness a weightiness. There ought to be something that makes us slouch down a bit on our shoulders when we consider God's otherness than us and our status as creature and him as creator. We we might say it like this. God is being presented as the creator of the heavens and the earth and a sinner creature ought to feel a heaviness and a weight and there ought to be a thoughtfulness that he is other from me. He is different from me. He is Lord, Master. He is ruler of all rulers. He is king of all kings. I am peasant, beggar, (laughs) servant, creation. There's a kavod. Kavod is the idea to be properly humbled and put in your place when you consider God's godness and your status as creature. Of course, that turns into then if we consider God and his godness and we're humbled by it, it turns into what? Expressions of praise. How could I not worship you? You're other than me. How could I not praise you for who you are? And when I see the expanse of your creation and the entire universe, how am I not brought low to realize there is something you've done that I could never fully grasp or comprehend in your creative power? The heavens are preaching a single sermon. And that is, consider your maker, consider your creator, be humbled, be brought low, consider your status before him, and then ascribe to him what he is due, his glory. You might say it this way, creation's sermon is reminding you that each day of your life, you don't exist for your glory, you exist for his glory. God didn't tell the sun to come up because the day's about you. The sun rose to preach you a sermon that this day belongs to God and it's for him. Creation's sermon is singular. You are to ascribe heaviness and weight and reverence and awesomeness and praise to your creator. Verse two drives it home because creation's sermon is loud and clear, but it has no words. It's a silent sermon. Notice verse two. Day to day pours forth speech, more of creation's sermon, and night reveals knowledge. So day and night upon your conscience, the same sermon is coming as you consider days and nights. You're to live for God's glory. But notice, creation's sermon is a silent sermon. Verse three. There is no speech and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. What is he saying? Creation's message is loud and clear. It's just not audible. (laughs) Creation's silent sermon may not have words, but we should get the point. (laughs) When a sinner who is creature considers the sun and the moon and the stars and all of God's creative power and how God brought the world into existence from nothingness, it's meant to put the sinner in their place and remind them that while I may not hear words coming from the mountaintops and the sea and the oceans and the sun and the stars and the sky, it should remind me the message is clear. I'm creature, he's creator. Today's for him, not me. 
Charles Spurgeon says this, the sun, the moon, and the stars are God's traveling preachers. That's right. God brings the sun up, beloved, each day. God created the entire earth and all it contains to send us a message. Creation's sermon is your day, your life, your attitudes, your actions, everything about you is to exist for the glory of God. His praise, devotion to him, honor to him, obedience to him, reverence for him. It's not about us, it's about him. And this silent sermon from creation, it's actually an international message. Notice verse four. Their line, that is creation's line, speaking of going across the entire earth, has gone through all the earth and their utterance to the end of the world. Think of measuring tape and just think of it wrapping around the whole globe. The message goes international. And notice, to the end of the world. That is to say, every soul, whether they acknowledge it or not, are receiving creation's message. Your life is to exist for the glory of God. Whether you live for that or not will be your response to your creator. But the message is the same. Every day you wake up, every day creation is preaching to you. Life is about God's glory, not self-glory. Life is about his honor, not your honor. Life is about his majesty, not your significance. Notice he goes on at the end of verse four. In them, that is the heavens, your creator, he even did something you couldn't do. He put a tent over the sun. I don't think you and I could put a tent over the sun. We can't even put sunglasses on and get the sun out of our eyes hardly. Have you tried to stare at the sun lately? Well, your creator, he decided he'd throw a tent over the sun. That's darkness. Again, another reminder, he does something that's other from us. We cannot do what he does. To throw a tent over the sun is describing darkness coming over light. God brings light and God brings darkness. Every day and every night, the sermon's the same. Life's not about your glory, it's about his. Now, the sun really comes into play here in verse five and we need to see this because this is a great reminder and I hope that by the time we're done with verse five, you never think about a sunrise the same again. Because the sun here is about to be described in a way that maybe you hadn't thought about what the sun was actually doing when it rose because the sun is a very excited sun when it rises up and it's very anxious to get you its sermon. So the sun's sermon, the sun's preaching, notice verse five, he continues his thought on the sun. By the end of verse four, he ends with the sun and verse five, he picks up the sun. Verse five, the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. So the sun goes around the globe and does its circuit day after day. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Why is the sun being described here as a bridegroom and as this strong warrior is the idea? Notice in the text there, He rejoices as a strong man running its course. It's language of a warrior, a strong warrior. Why is the sun's rising now compared to a bridegroom who's a strong warrior? Well, this will make sense to you in a moment. What do we know about bridegrooms, grooms on their wedding day? On the wedding day, if you're going to get married, you don't wake up that day like every other day. If it's the man's wedding day, he doesn't go, oh, well, just another relaxing day. No, he bursts out of bed. Today's my wedding day. I feel like a strong warrior today. I emerge excited, anticipating, ready to marry my fiance. Today's the wedding day. There's nothing passive. There's nothing, um, there's nothing non-excited. Everything about a groom on his wedding day is bursting forth with what? Anticipation. He cannot wait to marry his bride to be. A wedding day is full of fervor, excitement, zeal, and he feels like a strong warrior on his wedding day. Well, the sun is described to that. That's the illustration for the sun. But the sun is not excited to get up because it's the sun's wedding day. 
Now you're seeing the metaphors merge here. The sun is excited and bursting forth on the horizon and putting out its first rays of light because it is excited to preach creation's sermon to you. Your day exists for the glory of God, not yourself. I mean, is that an amazing thing? When you look at a sunrise, today I drove here in the morning and I was watching the sunrise early and I thought, there's your sermon, Darren. Today's not about you. Today is not about your glory, it's not about your honor, it's not about your fame, it's not about your significance. Today you exist for one purpose. Sun is reminding you when it arises and it's excited to get up and tell you. Like a bridegroom bursting forth on the wedding day, the sun is telling you today is for the glory of God. It's for him to be adored, honored, obeyed, esteemed, and lifted up. You almost could think about it like this. When you feel those first sun rays hit your face in the morning when you watch the sun rise, let it sink in that the kavod, the glory of God is upon you. The weight, the heaviness, the godness of God, he's different from you. He made that and he made you. And as you glance into that power and consider yourself compared to your creator in the sun, You just tell yourself, (laughs) today is about my Lord. It's not about me. I mean, think of this, dear ones. What are your days lived for? Are they lived for your glory or God's glory? What if you got up in the morning and when you saw the sun rise, I know some of you haven't seen the sun rise in a while, but you can get up early. When you get up early, it's dark and then it turns light. And then the sun comes up. (laughs) But what if you got up in the morning and you saw the sun rise and you said, good morning, Lord. Thank you for the reminder. I know who today is about. It's about you and not me. What a simple way to recalibrate our minds. David is meditating on creation sermon to remind his soul what every day and every moment exists for, the glory of God. Notice that last line there, though, back in verse six. There's something else being said here that's important. And notice it says, there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now we go from light to heat. What is he saying? No person can escape the heat of the sun. Every soul is accountable to the creator that their day is to be for his glory. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they're accountable because they feel the heat of the sun and they are under their creator. I get a kick out of reading sometimes about atheists and agnostics and people that reject creation and they try and find their way to describe creation without a creator. They always end up in the same place, frustrated, Even Albert Einstein, interestingly enough, he thought he had it nailed until he got to look into Hubble's telescope. And here's a quote from him after looking into Hubble's telescope. The great Albert Einstein, the great intellect and mind of his day. He says this, the circumstances of an initial moment of creation irritates me. The human mind, no matter how highly trained, cannot grasp the universe. He says this, When we consider the universe, we're in the position of a little child. (laughs) He was frustrated. He could not figure out, how do I describe this whole thing without a creator? You can't. And then one of my favorite stories is from a man named Robert Jastrow. He's a self-declaring agnostic and he's not a believer. In his frustration, he ended up writing a book called God and the Astronomers. And he concludes his book with this paragraph. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak and he pulls himself up over the rock and he is greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries, end quote. Sad day for those guys. Pagans can try and deny creation power, but even the heat reminds them they're accountable. What about us? This is a meditation for believers. 
Think about this, beloved. Let me just capture creation. Let me stick this meditation in your mind, then we'll move to the next one. Each day the sun rises and you experience its light and its heat. Each moment you consider an ocean wave, a mountain peak, a moment of spring color, a prairie full of life, a fall breeze, a leaf changing, a magnificent creature, and the beautiful variety of God's color, shape, sizes, and creation. Before you leave that moment, you just remind yourself, creation is preaching you a sermon. All of this reminds you that life is not about your glory, it's about God's. You belong to him as his creature, and everything you do in your life is to be to ascribe honor to his name, not yourself. Today is for God's glory, not our own. That's David's first meditation, a meditation on creation. Second meditation. If that's a meditation on creation that God is pleased with, now let's move from general revelation, how God revealed himself in creation, to God's special revelation, how God's revealed himself in scripture. There is a bit of conjecture at times from theologians wondering why one to six makes such a switch in seven to 10 where we go from general revelation to special revelation. And then David at the end of the Psalm largely responds to the special revelation. And it's probably good to at least acknowledge this. There is something that special revelation scripture can do that general revelation cannot General revelation can notify the sinner their life exists for the glory of God, but it is the special revelation, the revealing of God from his word that can change the nature of the sinner and save them. And so it may be he's making a bit of a shift here. Either way, the meditation still brings us to consider scripture in a fresh way. And so this is our second meditation, a meditation on scripture that God is pleased with. Have you ever thought about just sitting and musing and chewing on the power of scripture? Because that's about David's about to do. He's about to look at scripture from every angle. And as he considers the revelation that God has given in his word, it heightens and increases his worship. Just the sheer fact that he gets to know God through his word. David is overwhelmed at this moment at the power of the word of God. Now, something's interesting here. If you look in the text, in Psalm 19, when we think about verses seven to 10, there's something important. The verbs that are used here, and I'll describe what this means, they're causative verbs, which means they're cause and effect verbs. And and here's why that's important. He's about to describe souls being restored, simple becoming wise, the depressed becoming joyful, and the blind having their eyes opened. The verb tenses he uses is conveying this. It would be impossible for the soul to be restored, the simple to become wise, the depressed to become joyful, and the blind to have their eyes open with any other agent than scripture. If you replace human wisdom, psychology, um, human experience, if you put anything else in the place of scripture, souls are not restored, eyes are not open, the depressed don't become joyful, and the simple can't become wise. The only agent that can bring this change is scripture. That's why it's causative. The scripture causes the change. And I've said this quote to you before, but it's one of my favorites, and it really goes to seven to 10. It was Dr. John MacArthur who said, many books can change your life, but only one can change your nature. And really, that's what we're seeing here. Where the work only God can do can come through the word of God and scripture. So let's look at this together. A meditation on Scripture. Notice what he says there now first with that in our minds. He says, verse seven, let's meditate on scripture a little bit. The law of the Lord is perfect. Law there is just speaking of God's revelation, scripture. What you hold in your hands is the law of the Lord. But notice how he describes it. And you'll see this theme. He says what scripture is and then what scripture does. Notice what it is. The law of the Lord is perfect, literally without defect. Quite literally, here's how you could say it. The scripture cannot be improved upon. You can't add to it to make it more clear. You can't uh, put anything in it to make it more perfect. 
You could say it this way. The scripture has no limitation in its perfection. It is absolutely powerful and perfect. It is unimprovable, as one author has said. And look at what this agent of scripture is only able to do. Notice, the law of the Lord is perfect, without defect, absolutely powerful to do what? Restore the soul. That is to say, there are areas in our life, our inner life, soul problems. You could be lost and you have a soul problem. And the idea of restoration is where there's a problem in your soul, something's broken, there's only one agent can fix what's broken, and that is the scripture. So let's consider a person that's lost, that doesn't know Christ. They have a soul that's unrestored to God. You can give them human wisdom, you can give them human philosophy, you can give them an experience, you can give them evidence, you can do all you want. Nothing will change their nature and their soul until they encounter God in scripture. So one of my friends has said, the gospel's not broken. The law of the Lord is perfect. So think how arrogant it is if we think we need to add something to perfection to reach someone. Think how silly and futile it is when we have inner life issues that we try and solve with something other than the word of God. That's like saying to God, God, thank you for your perfect word. I know it can't be improved upon. I know it's without defect. I know it's the only thing that can change the soul, but I'm gonna go over here and have these other things try and help me. You're notifying God. I know you said your scripture's enough, but I'm gonna tell you it's just not doing it for me, God. How could we say that to perfection, beloved? Name the heart issue. Name the life turmoil. Name the trouble you could have in your soul as a believer. So that was an unbeliever a moment ago, their soul being restored. What about a believer? Name the besetting sin. Name the anxiety. Name the depression. Name the difficulty. Whatever soul trouble you face, God says, I have a perfect remedy. My word, you don't need more than it. I've given you all you need. It is sufficient. Do you believe that? When you read that, I mean, just look at it. When you see that God says, my word is absolutely perfect to perform restoration and soul work, sanctifying work, salvation work. Do you believe every inner life issue you face, scripture is enough? I mean, we can say it, but do you believe it? When our soul is troubled, we have a perfect source when anybody else's soul is troubled, we have a perfect source. If you're a parent, you've got the perfect parenting manual. If you're married, you have the perfect guide on how to have a godly marriage. If you're struggling with fear and anxiety, you have the perfect guide on how to overcome fears and worries. If you're battling a certain sin, you have the perfect manual. If you face a significant trial and it's hurtful and hard and difficult, if you have relational strain, do you run to the source that God says is perfect or do you look for imperfect sources? to aid you in soul work. Listen, anywhere else you look cannot restore your soul. It can't. Only scripture, remember cause and effect, only the word of God can truly bring full restoration. Everywhere else you look, you may get temporary help, but restoring the soul, that's the thorough work in the heart. And I might just add, can we just say something about ministry here? If we think at Cornerstone, we need to look outside scripture on how to do ministry. If we think we need the latest trend or maybe the latest book on church planning or the latest fad or the latest way that you're really gonna reach people. Can you imagine what a ministry is saying to God when they do that? You know, God, I know you've given me an entire philosophy of ministry and all the doctrine I need in scripture but it's just not enough to reach people. You just don't know the way to soul care, God. Listen, nothing could be more arrogant, proud, rebellious against God than for a church to think they need to go outside of scripture for soul care. Why? Look at the text. It's perfect, beloved. It has no blemish. If God has spoken it, it is perfect. Not only is it perfect restoring the soul, look back in the text, it's reliable to make the naive wise. Look at verse seven. 
It's reliable to make the naive wise. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Testimony is a a word to describe the power of Scripture. And the word for sure there in your New American Standard means reliable. Or in the verb, it is certain. It is trustworthy. It is true. It is true to do what? What can it do? Notice the text. It can make the simple become wise. What is the simple? Well, you know that word probably from Proverbs. It's the naive. Um, A good translation of the naive from the Hebrew root is an open door mind. So the root of the word naive is to have an open door. And naive is to have an open door mind. So a naive person lets air in and sin in and truth in and the door is just open. Truth and error just running in and out all the time. That's a naive person. To become wise is actually to learn the scriptures and learn knowledge, start applying it and rejecting error and only letting in truth. Closing the door on error, but opening it to truth. Sending truth out the door and closing it. I mean, sending air out the door and closing it and letting the truth remain. The only way a person can go from naivety, silliness, wandering, proneness to drift, which is what the naive do, to biblical wisdom, which is to walk in the fear of the Lord, is not getting a PhD. It's not being a psychology major. It's not how many degrees you have. It's not your intellect. It's not your IQ. It's not what you got on the SATs. It's not if you're cum laude, whatever. Scripture. Intake of the word of God believed in your heart takes a person that's naive to being wise. Let me say something to our young people here. We have young people sitting in here, high schoolers, down, middle schoolers, even, you know, upper teens, low 20s. You know, sometimes people will say that person's just wise beyond their years. If it's a Christian that they're talking about, it's because that young person has committed themselves to learning and applying the word of God. The word of God takes you from naivety and foolishness to wisdom. Only the scriptures can do that, beloved. It makes you fear God and walk in wisdom. Next, not only the scripture can restore what is broken, not only can it take the naive and make them wise, but notice it can take the depressed and make them happy, make them rejoicing. Notice verse eight, the precepts of the Lord are right. Right there is, I'll talk about in a moment, but look at what they do. They rejoice the heart. The idea is that the heart is not in a state of rejoicing. And so the, the, the language is describing if the heart is depressed, if the heart is melancholy, if your spirit is down, if your attitude is discouraged, if you find yourself low, there is one remedy you can run to that can take the heart from a state of depression and sadness and discouragement to a state of joy and rejoicing. And it is, notice, the precepts of the Lord. You could even translate precepts, they're promises. I mean, nothing can discourage, encourage a discouraged heart more than what? Promises from the word of God. But let's talk about this word right for a second because this is such a confidence builder in scripture. God says his scriptures are right. That's a really interesting word there, right. Um, It's the word used to to, um, describe a completely flat road. Think of a perfect road. So don't think Houston. Don't think driving in Houston. Bad illustration. Bumpy roads in Houston. Non-right roads. (laughs) Everywhere you go, you're bumping. I'm... This is a word to describe a completely flat road. There's no depression, no elevation. The idea would be without air. Completely perfect, this flattened road. He takes that concept of rightness, of complete perfection with no variation and applies it to scripture. So he's speaking to the inerrancy of scripture. Scripture has no air. But not only inerrancy, infallibility, which is a great theological word to describe. Not only does the scripture not have error, infallibility is the the doctrine on scripture that says it's incapable of error because God spoke it. God cannot lie, he cannot speak error. So the scriptures are right in that they're infallible. It's impossible for them to have error. It not only speaks of inerrancy, infallibility, but it speaks of veracity. That's a word we use for scripture's accuracy. 
God's word is not only without error, not only incapable of error, but it's absolutely accurate. Why? It comes from a divine source. There's a divine author who is God who's given it. How could it have error? Listen, there is lots and lots of guys that have started in seminary and went and got a degree and then headed off to Europe somewhere to Oxford or Cambridge or went to Scotland and came back. And when they came back, they became suspicious of the veracity of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture. Listen, when you start to question whether the Scripture is without error, you have taken up a dispute with God and called him a liar. Because God says, my word when I speak it is without error. So if it came from God, it has no error. To say anything otherwise is to call God a liar. In fact, it puts the soul in jeopardy if you don't think when God speaks, it's without error. Well, what does that scripture do? It accomplishes its task if it's that powerful. Notice what it does. It rejoices the heart. I love that. And I said it a moment ago, but it brings the heart from a state of sadness to gladness, from depression to joy, from being downcast to hope in him. This doesn't mean just feelings, beloved. This is a confidence in your soul and a joy in your God by running to his word. Let me ask you, dear friends in here who struggle with bouts of depression, bouts of discouragement, anxiety. I get it. I, I've battled all those things. I've had ups and downs. Some of you that go in and out of big swings of discouragement and encouragement. When you get low, where do you go? Do you run to promises from your God about his character? about his goodness, about his love, about his patience? Do you run to the gospel, remind yourself of your forgiven sin in Christ? Do you dwell on what is pure and lovely and right? Do you go to the one resource that can take your sad soul and make it rejoice? Because listen, anywhere else you run besides scripture and your God, if you get relief, I promise you it'll only be temporary. Anywhere else you run and you try and replace it with scripture, you will not find a heart that's thoroughly rejoicing again in your God. He is the only resource to make the sad, depressed soul happy. You can add all kinds of other things. You can run all kinds of other places. Temporary relief. I spent many years of my life running partially to God, but then to other things. It wasn't until I sold out on the sufficiency of Scripture, the rightness of Scripture, the veracity of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, and I staked my soul that if you say this, God, I believe you. When I did that, man, I found peace for my soul like I never found before, but that is an act of faith because you are taking God at his word. He keeps going. Not only that, verse eight. I mean, could the scripture get any better? It just keeps going. It just keeps going. Verse eight. The commandments of the Lord are pure. Verse eight. Enlightening the eyes. Now he moves from promises and precepts and the law of God to thou shalt and thou shalt not. Commandments. What we're told to do by God. So what is he saying here? The commandments of the Lord are pure. That means they're clean. They're bright. They're radiant. What's interesting about this is those pure, bright, radiant commandments, notice what they do. They enlighten the eyes. Literally, the idea is if you have spiritually fuzzy vision, if you can't see clearly because um, there's some area of your life where you're not commandment keeping, so commandments are in view and clear vision is in view. So if you have commandments that are being told to you and you're not keeping them, that leads to a burdened conscience. That leads to a lack of spiritual clarity. That leads to spiritually foggy vision. He said, but if you embrace the commandments and you start obeying them and you see them as pure and best for you, guess what'll happen? That spiritual vision that's foggy, it'll become clear. The areas where you didn't see as clearly and you weren't thinking through things well because your conscience was burdened and your spiritual lenses weren't pure, that'll fall off and your eyes will be enlightened. It'll become bright and radiant. I, I've told young guys as I've discipled them over years the same thing again and again. I'll say, brothers, Purity leads to clarity. 
Live a pure life and you'll have clear spiritual vision. Live an impure life and you're gonna have fuzzy spiritual vision. This is why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 8, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God clearly. You want clarity in your life, beloved? You want eyes that are enlightened with wisdom and discernment and thoughtfulness? Live a holy life. People that are all confused all the time about all kinds of spiritual things, can't see clearly like the Galatians, or they're bewitched, they don't know which way is up or down. The disciples, they struggled with this, didn't they? All the time they were struggling to see things rightly and Jesus was admonishing them about their ambition. You can't see who I am because you wanted to establish an earthly kingdom and sit at my right or my left. If you guys would humble yourself and be holy and listen to me, you would see more clearly. You want to have clear spiritual vision? Look at the commandments as pure and keep them and you will have it. And you know where this same verb is used? Genesis 1.15, speaking of creation light coming into darkness. God literally shines light into dark areas of our heart and mind when we obey him. What a sweet promise. A couple more. Look back in the text. David goes on now in verse nine. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. You may have thought to yourself, wait, he's been talking about scripture and now he says the fear of the Lord. What's going on here? Well, in the Hebrew mind, to fear God and love scripture were the same thing. So to say the fear of the Lord is just to say scripture. In fact, they're used as synonyms all over the place. Psalm 34, 11, other places. The fear of the Lord is scripture. So he's just saying the scriptures are clean. That is, they have no flaw or defect. And then notice what he says. The scriptures, this is a summary statement, they endure forever. They literally stand forever. Think about this. The scriptures that are clear now today, in 10 billion years, they will be standing just as clear in eternity. They never change. They stand upright, they're clear, and they endure forever. Why would we trust anything more than the scriptures that will stand up for all eternity? And then verse nine, he continues. The judgments of the Lord are true. That means firm and stable. They are righteous. They're sufficient. Beloved, no wonder when he concludes this, David says, after I consider the scriptures and I think that about them and I meditate about them, look at what he says in verse 10. How could they not be more desirable than gold, yet much fine gold? I want scripture more than all the riches of the world and they're sweeter than honey and any drippings of the honeycomb, the finest honey in the world, they could not be sweeter to me than just to have the taste of the word of God in my mouth. Beloved, do you realize this right here, what you hold in your hand, this is a divine book with divine power, endowed by God with his very power. God decided to communicate himself through his word. It's authoritative, it's sufficient, it's reliable, it's pure, it's voracious, infallible, it's certain, it's inerrant. How could we love anything more than this, right? Right? That's our second meditation. Wow, a meditation on scripture that is pleasing to God. Now, we've seen a meditation on creation, a meditation on scripture. Both of them are breathtaking. I mean, who doesn't want to meditate on creation? Who doesn't, who's now not excited to go watch their next sunrise and worship the Lord, right? And who doesn't love thinking about scripture? I mean, if you don't leave here today as a believer more confident in your Bible, then you've missed something. Who doesn't want that? And yet this third meditation, we're not always ex as excited about it. Because David goes from creation to scripture to looking at his own heart and sin. I mean, we're excited about creation, excited about scripture, but man, do we really have to go and start meditating on our sin and our hearts and our weaknesses? Well, the man after God's own heart, King David, when he gets done with looking at creation and then scripture, his only response is, God, I wanna make sure there's not sin in my heart that you're not getting glory in because I'm not dealing with it. In fact, he's gonna meditate on his heart and the scriptures, and he's actually gonna ask God to help him see if he has blind spots that could lead him to total rebellion against God. Now, when I say a third meditation on the heart, 
Let me tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean you evaluate your heart by yourself. You don't hit, sit here and say, well, I'm gonna evaluate what's going on in my heart by myself as if you're a good arbiter. To meditate on your own heart is to meditate it in light of looking at scripture and asking the spirit to bring clarity to you as you pray before God and look at his word. So let's look at this. And this will be a quick wrap up. The Psalm just really unfolds here quickly. So the third meditation, creation, scripture, now the heart in light of scripture. Let's look at what he says here. Verse 11, moreover, by them, that is scripture, your servant is warned. That is to say, God, when I start looking at your word and I look at revelation and I look at what you're revealing to me, I'm realizing there's some areas in my heart as I pray before you where I need to be challenged, warned, maybe even discouraged to go one direction and encouraged to go another direction. He's looking at scripture and looking at his heart and saying, Lord, where have I become callous to sin? Where has my conscience become gunked up? Where is it I'm not thinking seriously enough about commandments? I'm getting warned by your word. He's implying looking at the word is keeping me from further sin. And we know that because he goes on. Notice, by them, the scriptures, your servant is warned. And then he switches and says, but if I heed your warnings at the end of 11 and I keep your word, there is great reward. We teach our kids this, right? Sin leads to suffering, blessings lead to obedience. It also works for adults. <laughs> obedience, excuse me, leads to blessings. He says, God, if I heed your warnings and I don't run towards my sin and I listen to your word and I ask you to reveal my heart before me and I run from sin and warnings and I run towards obedience, look at what it says. There's reward, a clear conscience, clear spiritual vision, a restored soul, becoming wise. Everything seven to nine says comes into play when we take our hearts before the Lord like this. But then notice what he says here. He gets more specific. I mean, Beloved, do we meditate like this? I mean, do you go before God and crack open your heart and say, God, show me my sin. Show me my ugliness. Show me if I have a blind spot where I've deceived myself and I can't see it clearly. I'm studying your word. I'm thinking on your glory. Show me if there is areas where I have become vulnerable, where I have become blind. Notice what he says. Also, Look at verse 12, he says, who can discern his heirs? Acquit me of hidden faults. Now, when he says who can discern his heirs, he's answering the question, no one. If you say, who can actually help me see my heart rightly? The answer is not you. God can though. God can help you take an audit on your heart by going to him in his word and praying and asking him to help you see things and the spirit will enlighten your eyes. The spirit will convict your heart. The spirit will help your soul be restored. When he says, who can discern his heirs? He's saying no one can, but God can. And so then look at the next line in 12. God, acquit me of hidden faults. What are hidden faults? Think of hidden reefs underwater. Areas of sin I don't see the fullness of where I could take my ship of my spiritual life over them and they could sink me. Hidden sins. God, help me see if there's hidden sins I'm not working on, something I'm not battling, something I don't see. Where in my sanctification is there a gap, Lord? Help me see it. I don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall. Literally, acquit means preserve me, God, so I don't go off track. And then he gets even more serious. 13, also, keep back your servant. Think of this language. He's pleading, your servant, God, I belong to you. Keep me from presumptuous sins. You know what presumptuous sins are? Arrogant sins, proud sins, sins where you've become self-reliant and overconfident and you've rationalized them. You don't even see them anymore and you just step into sin with confidence. King David is saying, God, help me see my heart rightly before I step into the types of high-handed sins that would be pure rebellion against you. Wow. What a meditation. Do you pray like that? Do you go to God like that? I mean, this week I was convicted. I was going back before the Lord thinking, all right, Lord, am I praying this way? And when I began to pray this way, man, buckle up. Because <laughs> the spirit cuts. 
And the word comes in and I started confessing areas of weakness and vulnerability and I just saw, man, I have become lazy in some areas. Thank you, Lord, for this meditation on my heart. I don't want to get into presumptuous, high-handed, heavy sins. I want to deal with them when they're at the motive level, the attitude level, the, the mind level. I don't want to get into the actions. And he says, if you do this, beloved, look at it. There's hope. Well, back up first. He says, they can become so serious, they can dominate my life. Look at the middle of 13. Let not them rule over me, dominate me. Lord, keep me from sins that could dominate my life. And then he says this, and if I come to you that way, Lord, I can emerge from that type of meditation with clarity and look at what he says. Then I will be blameless. Blameless doesn't mean without sin. Blameless means there's nothing left in your life that, you, that is unrepentant, that's proud, that you're not dealing with. You're living a life of integrity. And then notice what he says. And I shall be acquitted of great transgression. I will be preserved from living a life where I find myself in serious sin. And guess what, beloved? David can tell us this. He can preach this to us. He can challenge us today. I can challenge you today with my whole heart. But a season came in David's life where he stopped listening to his own counsel, didn't he? And he found himself in grievous sins. That is to say, we never stop having to take our hearts before God like this. We must live here. And you know what? If you do, guess what you emerge in? Now 14 jumps off the page. If you live this way and you meditate this way, notice, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock, my stronghold, and my redeemer, my savior. Beloved, that third meditation is to result in a pure and sanctified life. We meditate on creation. We meditate on scripture and we meditate on our heart in light of scripture. And when we do, guess what? You're at the bottom of 13 and 14. You'll be acquitted from great transgressions and your mouth will be full of his praise and the meditation of your heart will be pure. Amen? What a sweet text. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the time we had in it today. We ask you that you would help us be people that are as excited and full in our hearts to meditate on creation and scripture as we are even our own weaknesses so that we would be a holy people. In any area of our life that doesn't bring you glory, we would work on it, we'd repent, we'd confess so that we would be a, a people that wouldn't find ourselves in grievous sins. We would avoid the trap that David fell in when he took a season off from evaluating his heart before you. And we'd be a holy people. And as we sing this next song, may we sing joyfully. Praiseworthy is your name. And we thank you that you remind us of these things to keep us from hidden sins, hidden reefs, blind spots, Lord. We need it. In your name we pray, amen.